unwind. He wants to go to sleep. He's really tired, but he can't unwind. And so um, the song Jolie Blanc came on the radio. Joel Saunier. Some of you may know who he is. And he was singing that. And Doris just out of his head imagined her and painted Julie Blanc without a model, without anything. It's pretty great. That was back in 1974. And over the years after that, he painted her more than 200 times. And he used different models for her, um, including myself simply because I'm blonde, <laughs> we, and, and I was right there in handy. <laughs> and he did this painting of me in 2003 as Jolie Blanc. This is actually called She Never Saw Me, where the dog is sneaking up on her. Now he used, it's interesting about the blue dog, the blue dog, just like Jolie Blonde, is a, a myth, a legend. It's rooted in Cajun mythology. Um, when George was a little boy, his mama used to tell him, Baby George, if you're not good today, the Lugaru's gonna come eat you tonight. And Lugaru, his mama was French, Lugaru means werewolf or crazy wolf. And uh, when years later, when George was painting all these legends and mythologies like Jolie Blanc, he decided to paint this Lugaru along with those legends. He wanted to capture all of Louisiana, you know, in the same way that someone would write a book about Louisiana and about particularly um, Cajun country, Louisiana, um, he decided he would paint it. The way he would describe it is he said, I'm going to graphically interpret Louisiana. So in other words, he would look at a painting and learn all you need to know about this area, even if you didn't get to read a book. You could look at one painting and learn a whole plethora of things, kind of like what I just told you about Jolie Blonde. So with the Lugaru, when he decided to paint it, he went through his studio files and he found an old photograph of his dog, Tiffany, who had been dead for many years. And he used Tiffany's shape and stance and painted her as this scary werewolf. And he painted her out in a cane field on a tombstone, because that's how his mama would describe the legend to him. And she was actually a little black and white dog. But he thought that the dark night sky, the blue night, the blue moon, would cast this blue-gray shade on her fur. And so the early blue dog paintings were a very pale gray blue. And he also, the early ones, had red eyes. So it was supposed to be scary. Not scary anymore, but it was supposed to be scary in the beginning. That's how it started off. And he really liked it. And he painted it while he was doing all of these other pieces, a lot of paintings like this all about New Iberia and all about his hometown and painted them all around the same time. And um, he got really attached to the image and he started painting it more and more. And one day, this was in 1989, he was having an exhibition in Los Angeles, California. It was an exhibition of 50 paintings and he had about 10 of these Lugaru paintings in there along with these kind. And he overheard the people say, what's with this blue dog? <coughs> and he goes, blue dog? What are they talking about? And he realized that they were talking about his paintings. He hadn't thought about it that way before. He called it Lugaru. So it was very interesting because it was the public, people like you all, looking at his work, that in some ways gave him the idea. The way George would describe it is that he overheard the word blue dog, the words blue dog, and he, he would always go like this with his hand and he'd say, and something clicked in my head. And from then on, I painted different. And what he did is when he got back to Louisiana from California, he went to his easel, pulled out a huge canvas, about eight feet tall, gigantic. And he painted for the first time ever, a painting without the Louisiana background, a painting without the oak tree. He painted just a gigantic, wild-looking dog. And he was really excited about it. He thought, he recognized immediately that he had done something important and done something really powerful. So how can you keep painting dogs over and over again and keep them interesting? How did he do that? Well, 
He did that because he didn't think of this as a dog, just like he didn't think of the oak trees when he painted them as trees. He thought of them as shapes, designs. He recognized that when you cut a tree off at the top like this, it would make the sky small underneath the branches and the light would shine from underneath the branches just like it does in Louisiana. You know, Texas is known as the state with the big sky. But he said, Louisiana is not like that. Our sky is small because we're looking at it from underneath the trees. So he made the tree a very symbolic shape. I was saying he wanted to graphically interpret Louisiana. And so that's what he, he did so that you'd understand Louisiana by seeing what he did. So the same is the case here. For him, it wasn't a dog. For him, it was a shape. And so these shapes and designs, he used to say he used the blue dog to comment on life today. So he could take shapes and designs and express his own moods and express his own creativity. George would tell you that this shape right here is just as important as the dog itself. This was just as exciting to him. This, this, all just as exciting to him. This, all very purposeful. This painting also as big as those lockers. Really big. Scale was exciting for him too. He also liked to eventually put the dog back into landscapes, but also with other elements. And in very surreal, kind of unusual situations, he always would say that the dog is never an, a little dog down at your feet, like a dog really would be, right? The dog is eye level with you, so that you walk right up to it. That's why the paintings, so many of them are so big. The idea is that you walk right up to it and look it in the eye. So it's looking at you, and it's asking all these questions like, who am I? Where did I come from? Where am I going? All the questions that we all ask in our lives, all the questions that humankind has been asking since the beginning of time. And I believe that that's why the Blue Dog paintings remain so interesting, because the questions are never answered. They keep looking. The questions are answered, the mystery is gone, and then you don't need to look anymore, right? He's a big fan of music, George. Here's Elvis, <laughs> a hound dog. This painting was called You Ain't Nothing But a Hound Dog. So I was saying that George uh, didn't think of it as, as a dog at all and that it started as the Lugaru. It changed and developed over time and that's one of the wonderful things about art and being expressive also, of course, is that you can use your mood and your imagination to paint things or express things any way that you want um, and you can also keep changing. It doesn't have to stay that way. Just because it starts off a certain way, it doesn't have to. So the Lugaru was only the very early phases of the Blue Dog series. It got friendlier and friendlier, and eventually it became basically George himself, the Blue Dog Man, <laughs> painted with Elvis. Great. And with Louis Armstrong. That was the Jazz Fest poster in... Uh, 1995 and George was very fond of saying I told you about that big canvas that he painted when he came back from California and how excited he got that he could take the blue dog out of the landscape and he used to say I can take it anywhere I can take it into outer space I can take it to the far side of the moon so that liberation of being freed uh, from having to paint things a certain way was really very wonderful for him as an artist and as a person. <laughs> so I wonder, do any of you have any questions about George and about his paintings? Yes. Do you know how he had cancer? I do. He had cancer. And it's interesting because um, that's actually very connected to his art. Um, when he was first painting in those 
early dark dark paintings which unfortunately I don't have any to show you here but similar to this but these are actually some later Cajun pieces um, the pieces that he was doing even earlier than this um, very very dark and he painted in um, oil paints and he mixed it with turpentine and he did not follow the directions on the spray can of the varnish and all these warning signs that are very important to pay attention to when you're doing anything if it's got a warning sign on it and he didn't he was young and he was very excited about the work he was doing and instead of working in a ventilated area he as i would mention liked to work late at night and uh, so he would work up in the attic it was very closed in and he breathed in all the fumes and they poisoned him so it's ironic that the the paint did that um it didn't obviously affect him until a long time later but that is what happened and that's an interesting thing too is because it's that's such a good question because um it leads to how he could get to these bright colors from these now these are still pretty bright but the early ones were very very dark his early paintings were he, in fact he used to say that his trees were black very very dark paintings and so how does he get from that to something like this well one of the things is that when he they first told him that he was sick it was before he got cancer they, they knew something was going on um, he switched paints so that and to use a different kind of paint um, and it helped a lot and his health improved dramatically and that was a long time ago now a good 25 years ago he switched from oil paints to acrylic paints oil paints take a really long time to dry and acrylic paints dry very fast it's a water-based paint there's none of that turpentine and oil fumes none of that and so it was a much healthier way for him to go and um, it's interesting because acrylic paints are naturally much brighter and also because they dry so fast you're not doing all of this blending um, and working with them as long and anyway they prolonged his life a long time, these paints, and they also made his paintings a lot brighter. So it's interesting how uh, things in life that you might look at as um, unfortunate or sad could be turned around into things that make your life wonderful or make the lives for other people wonderful. And uh, that's why I'm here with you today, because uh, George made me promise that I would educate others about his work and that you can be creative and do anything you put your mind to. He decided to be an artist when he was in the third grade. He made it happen. His parents thought he was crazy. In fact, his mommy used to always say, she lived to be 103, she used to say, when are you gonna get a real job, George? You know, like at the telephone company. <laughs> she wanted him to have a pension. She was saying that up until she died. <laughs> you had a question? How old? Yeah. He was 69. That was uh, December 2013. And he was painting all the way up to here. Any questions? Yes. Do you paint? No, I don't paint. Um, I'm a big fan. And I like to write. And George and I, in fact, did a book together. And I brought several copies with me um, that I'm going to leave with Miss Monique for your library so that you all can read. I think you would enjoy it. It's got um, the whole history of the Blue Dog series is in here, uh, the whole history of his Cajun paintings, how he became an artist from New Iberia, and it's full of his quotes. We did the book together um, and it came out right about the time that he passed. So um, it's, it's really a neat way to learn more about him um, in his own words. Any questions? Yeah. Oh, I love that question. I wish I had a picture of it with me. Uh, remember that one I told you about? It was the first blue dog that he did outside of the landscape, that really big one, when he came back from California. That's my favorite. That's not only my favorite painting that George made, that's my favorite painting anybody ever made. Favorite, favorite. And I mentioned that it's eight feet tall. Uh, it hangs in my house. I have a little bitty house. I live in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Really? Yeah. And that painting is there and people come over to see it 
and they, you know what they do? They do exactly what they're supposed to do. They walk up to it and look it in the eye. Only because it's so big, nobody's eight feet tall, right? <laughs> and to be honest, it, it has to hang because the ceiling is eight feet. So it's just, you know, there. <laughs> so they, they walk up to it and I keep a, um, a bench by there and they stand on it so they can look the dog in the eyes. It's my favorite painting. And what's great about it, uh, George did that painting in 1990 and uh, he, um, <laughs> I went to work for him and met him in 1991. I went, I was living in New Orleans at the time and I went to work for him at the gallery in New Orleans and that painting was hanging on the wall. It's the first painting of his I ever saw. I walked in and walked right up to it. It became my favorite painting immediately. And all the Cajun paintings were around, which don't get me wrong, I love those too. But this is my favorite. And I talked and talked and talked about it. I went to work for the galleries and uh, the following year I went out to California, to Carmel, California and opened a gallery for George there. It's been there now 26 years. And I lived there for six years till we got married. And I wanted that painting to come to California and hang because I, I wanted to look at it. It was for sale. And um, my boss, not George, but the man who ran the galleries said, no, no, it's too expensive to ship because it's so big, you know, and you know, we're going to keep it here. And I made a deal with him. I said, well, if after a year it still hasn't sold, will you send it to me? And he said, um, yeah, that's a deal. Well, a year later, I'm calling him because it was the most expensive painting in the gallery. The biggest, most, George would do that. If he didn't want a painting to sell, he'd stick a really huge price on it to where if it did sell, it was worth it because he got that much money and otherwise he had the painting. So he was really happy. And so he had a huge price on it. And so he had it out in Carmel. I brought it out to Carmel and uh, we opened a gallery in Germany later that year. And I flew out to Germany to hire the staff and take the paintings in and open the gallery. And while I was out there, my coworker in California sold the painting. And she was so excited because it was the biggest sale we'd ever had. And she just was thrilled and couldn't wait to call me and I burst into tears. Aww. Because I could have cared less about the money. I wanted this painting in my life. And several years later, George and I got married. I never stopped talking about this painting all the time. And for our fifth wedding anniversary, he surprised me and gave it to me. He tracked down the man who owned it and made some kind of trade with him. And brought it back. So that's how I have it. Um, paintings are much more important than money. Paintings are much more important, George would say, than the artist. Paintings take on a life of their own long after the artist is gone. Uh, think about the Mona Lisa. We're all still wondering why the heck she's smiling, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> um, we don't know, because Da Vinci's not here. We can't ask him. But um, that's, that's the great thing about great pieces of art. They, they take on this whole life of their own long after the artist is gone. George would be the first to tell you that um, the reason that he does a painting, bless you, that the reason that he does a painting or what he sees in a painting um, isn't it or is just as important as what you see in it. If you if this painting reminds you of a dog you you have and you love that that's great that's just as important as George's reasons for painting it. If you don't like this painting that's great that's the great thing about art you don't have to like it. Um, George was very fond of quoting Picasso, Picasso, Pablo Picasso. I know you all have heard of the great uh, Spanish artist, Pablo Picasso. And uh, he was very famous for saying, it took me a whole lifetime to learn how to, to paint like a child again. Because when we, many of us, most of us, as we grow older, um, we become wrapped up in other things in life and all the responsibilities and all of that and what happens is our focus oftentimes becomes narrower and narrower and narrower and as a child you're wide open you're you're like the sky you can absorb things and see things and um, 
you don't have this. So that's the whole trick, is to keep it. And George always, he always had that. Uh, one of my favorite things that happened with him is um, we returned to California in 2000 and bought a house there and he built a studio and that's where he did most of his painting. And he loved California a lot. Um, not as much as Louisiana, but he loved it. And he loved painting out there. Sort of for the same reasons I was telling you that he liked to paint in the middle of the night because the phone wasn't ringing and no one was coming by. Well, in California, uh, we had a home out in the country on 18 acres. So it was lots of land, we didn't have any neighbors, nobody was dropping by. And uh, he could just paint all day and not be bothered, he loved it. And right after we got there and he started painting there, um, a reporter from the LA Times came up to interview him and said, oh, George, now that you're living in California, are you gonna paint the beach, the lone cypress, and all these things that are in the California hills and the redwoods? And George looked at him like he was crazy. And he said, why would I do that? He goes, my landscape is in here, and that's always Louisiana. It's great. It's really great. Any more questions? You guys ask good questions and get me off on tangents. Yes? Are they going down here from uh, New Mexico? No, but that is a good question, too. Um, it was George's idea. Ooh, I mean, it's, it's this. It's, what is this? Is this your name, Pat? Oh, they're Spanish. Oh, Spanish look at word. that. That's great. Yeah, the upper elementary, uh, this is the Spanish side. The other side is the French side. And they do it with art. That's wonderful. And since Messiah Montessori is an art integrated school. There you go. Everything's about art. <laughs> Let's talk about New Mexico then. That's perfect. <laughs> what a great segue. <laughs> uh, New Mexico is very much into the arts too. Fantastic. Santa Fe is very artsy. And uh, no, George did not live in Santa Fe, but um, we went there a lot. And he first started going there in the mid 1980s. Um, he really, really loved it, uh, mostly because it is such a great art scene. And also um, the houses, I was telling you that I've got that eight foot painting in my house. I have a little bitty house. It was actually the cemetery keeper's house. And the cemetery, the old cemetery is across the street I had like funerals in there and everything. Oh yeah. It's real small and it's all made of adobe. Have you seen, uh, have any of you seen an adobe house before? It's made of mud and hay packed together. Um, it's really amazing. It was built about 150 years ago. Um, the paint, the Lugaru painting like just fit in there. <laughs> and some of the bricks are exposed and stuff like that, yeah. It was tough. I had help. We turned it on its side, and then it was hard to get it up. And anyway, it's there for good. I'm not <laughs> it's there for good. So, um, but uh, we started going. Well, George started going there before I even met him. Um, he made a lot of friends there, and he would have art shows there with these friends and all those kind of things. And um, so when we started dating, which was in, I started working for him in 1990, but we didn't start dating until '93. And the first place he took me was Santa Fe, New Mexico. And it was the perfect halfway spot when you're driving, which we drove twice every year for 20 years, twice every year across the country from Louisiana to California. It's 3,000 miles. And we loved it. That was our trip every year. Sometimes we would take two, three weeks if we could get it. It was just fantastic. George always said that one of the greatest things about knowing um, financial success was to have the ability to travel so much because that inspired him so much in his art. And so he really loved the road trips. And so we would always stop in Santa Fe to see all of his old artist friends. And it was the one place that he would go. You would think this would be in, true in Louisiana or in California, but it just didn't happen for him. He, in, it was in New Mexico that he met other artists and bonded with them. So they would get together and show what their latest things were. We always had a bunch of Georgia stuff in the truck. And then he would look at theirs, they would look at his, and they would all bounce ideas off of each other. And it was just 
fantastic for me as a non-artist to kind of be the fly on the wall and watch all this happen. And uh, we've lost a lot of those people over the years, but a lot of them are still there. And so they're my friends today and I see them and go talk about their art with them and go to visit their studios. I just love it. Um, another reason George went through there a lot is he created a lot of his art there. Um, I've got, well, my ring. I don't know if any of you saw that or this little piece I'm wearing here. A lot of people don't know that George made jewelry. He made some really magnificent pieces. He didn't actually construct them, um, well, with some exceptions. Uh, there were some pieces where he actually carved the wax so that it could be made into a silver piece or a gold piece. He started doing that as early as the 70s, actually. Um, but more, when he, by the time he got was going to Santa Fe, which was, as I said, in the mid-80s, he was um, meeting with a jeweler, a silversmith that he got to know, an artist named Douglas Magnus, and they clicked so well that um, Mr. Magnus could basically read George's mind, you know, knew how he wanted things done. So George would do drawings and designs and they would work together and he made, they made incredible pieces of art. They made a number of pieces, uh, one of a kind pieces just for me. So I would get just fantastic surprises. Um, one, for example, is a belt, huge um, alligator belt that comes across here and then in giant silver, George's signature, this signature, right? In fact, it's about this size, right here, all in silver. Can you imagine like this? Pretty much something. I have to wear it just with a plain white t-shirt and jeans because it's, and uh, it's really great. He made um, wonderful earrings for me, Audrey, with this man. He made all kinds of neat things. And another thing that's neat too is that um, in, in New Mexico, uh, this man, Mr. Magnus, the silversmith, he owns mines, turquoise mine, 